So I'm going to talk about the Copan baseline. And so I, I study Maya archaeoastronomy, um, and I've done work in Copan, which I'll talk about today, and, and in Palenque. I also work for a nonprofit called Mayas for Ancient Mayan, or MAM, where we raise funds for uh, helping to teach and, and fund teachers who are Maya teachers who are teaching their Maya students how to read and write in the hieroglyphic script since it was lost and it, and epigraphers and archaeologists have reconstructed it and that's what I do and so now uh, we help to teach Maya people how to recover uh, the writing system of their ancestors. So um, I work at the Sacramento City College right now and uh, a teaching anthropology but my specialty is in the ancient Maya so here we are. This is the Copan Hieroglyphic Stairway, one of the longest texts in the Maya world, recounting the many different rulers in the dynasty of Copan, uh, and which went from you know 400s AD all the way through to 800s AD or so. And we see the first images uh, of Copan that reached the American and European audience coming from Frederick Catherwood, who went with John Lloyd Stevens back in the early mid part of the 1800s. And they were kind of the original Indiana Jones and, you know, going through the, the rainforest. And actually, John Lloyd Stevens bought the site of Copan for $50, I believe, from uh, farmers. Uh, there are Maya farmers still living there. And, uh, and of course, Maya people have known about these sites uh, ever since they were constructed. But the site itself was abandoned back in the, the late 700s, early 800s AD, when most of the Maya cities actually had collapsed. But if you go to Copan today, it's quite beautiful. This is the ball court as seen from uh, Temple 22, I believe. And this is the National Geographic reconstruction of the necropolis, where it's kind of like a layer cake, where the old buildings are way down below. Um, and then the later kings would build directly on top of the mortuary tomb of the, the, the founders. Uh, and in fact, this would be the founders, I believe, the, the founders tomb. Who, his name was Kinich Yash Kukmo. And here's a site map um, showing the great plaza up here. And, uh, and this is actually that site we were seeing here. This is where the, these temples actually were beneath those are the oldest site in the in in Copan but the whole site actually is built up from the rainforest right along the Copan river and and it, it's so high you wouldn't realize it's artificial terracing here but uh, the actual natural layer of the ground is far below there if we look here in the great plaza in the north this is uh, you can kind of go here and you see many of these stela have uh, have protections over top of them. Those are the original stela. This is a, a replacement, <clears throat> and the original was moved to the Copan Museum right on site. Um, but some of these stela are incredibly uh, well preserved and have this tradition of, of deeply incised carving. So you can really see and read the glyphs still very, very well. And here I am giving a, an explanation showing the position of, of uh, the ruler here, this is ruler number 13, and his name was Washaklahun Ubah Kawil, or 18 are the images of the god Kawil. And you can see Stila A, what it looked like when they had first cleared it back in the 1890s, uh, where, when Alfred Maudsley went there and hired a bunch of Maya people to, to help him clear the site. And, and he uh, took these glass plate photographs and had this incredible amount of, you know, glass plates that he had to trek through the rainforest in order to get to these sites. Okay, um, you can see here some of the casts made uh, for the British Museum. And, uh, and some of these came, I believe, from Maudsley himself in the 1890s. So the, they were when the monuments were in the best shape um, before they have since eroded in the past 100 years. And so uh, you see a number of Maya researchers, epigraphers, who are using a lot of these casts that are in storage in the British Museum, and they're now they're actually um, converting them into digital files and putting them online, which is really, really wonderful for us. Very cool project, speaking of museums. Okay, um, here's my drawing of Copan Stila A that I'm doing, uh, I, that I did for a paper that I'm writing right now. Um, and you can see how the text is incredibly, uh, incredibly well preserved in this case. 
And one of the monuments, the later monuments made by one of the last kings, whose name was Yashpasa, uh, right here. In fact, his name is spelled Yashpasa. Um, he is be being shown here receiving the torch from the founder some 400 years before him, whose name was Yashkukmo, and his name is actually written in his headdress here. And the, this has all of the different rulers of Copan surrounding this altar, which is quite spectacular. So we see the whole history of Copan in this monument. And this is a drawing or schematic of that monument. Okay, this ruler is the one that we're going to talk about today. He's ruler number 12, right here. And he's simply named as the Five Katun Lord. And a Katun is actually a period of about 20 years. It's actually 20 periods of 360 days. They shave off the five and a quarter days for their particular long, this long count that they use in order to keep, keep track of time from the moment of, of the latest creation for them, which was August 13th, 3114 BC, as we'll see. Anyway, to be a five Katun Lord, you have to live through at least one part of all five of those Katuns. So you need to be at least, uh, it's, you know, at least, let's see, not 80 years old, but 60 plus years old, because you have to have seen at least portions of five Katuns. So he ruled for a very long time. And here he is again, ruler 12. <clears throat> and here is again, named as the five Katun Lord. Okay, his name, and I'll move my little head here, uh, was nicknamed Smoke Imish. This was back when, before we could actually read a lot of the glyphs, because the decipherment of my hieroglyphic script has only really happened in the past 30, 40 years or so. Um, really, especially in the past 20 years, it's, it's coming together so that we read about 90% of the glyphs now. Um, phonetically, uh, although we may not know exactly what uh, the context is or what the, the actual meaning is of some of these, that's debated about still. But um, his name now we know is Kach, which means fire, Uti, which means is the mouth, um, and then Wits, which is a waterfall, a waterfall serpent being. And then Kawil, and Kawil is that deity who has that mirror in his forehead with smoke coming out of a celt or an axe that's in the in the mirror. And he's equivalent to the central Mexican deity known as Tezcatlipoca, or the Lord of the Smoking Mirror. And for the Maya of the classic period, he represented the lineage or the dynasty, and they would pass the Kawil staff from one king to the next. So his name is Kahutiwitz Kawil, and he ruled from 628 to 695 AD. And he oversaw a long period of, uh, of Copan's history. And so we know when he actually became ruler. I don't think we have a, a birth date for him. You know, we see many of the, of the other kings actually love to talk about their birth date and their death date. But for this particular period, we see mostly just accession dates. So when these kings became became king and ascended to the throne. And he did that on February 8th of 628 uh, AD, or this, this would just say in the Julian calendar, because the Western calendar, it turns out, is not so effective. And the one used by the Romans, you know, felt that uh, was actually not accurate. So it had to be readjusted that in the 1500s, actually, 1580s, um, it became the Gregorian calendar. So we now use the Gregorian calendar and, and to fix the actual year to the season so it doesn't drift. Uh, but in the Julian calendar, this would be the date, and astronomers often use this. Because when we go back to 628, the actual date, Feb February 5th, was actually um, not on February 5th, if that makes sense. Okay, so this particular king lived through, as we said, you know, portions of five cartoons over his whole life. But one of the most important cartoons or the periods of 20 years was the 11th cartoon of the ninth Baktun. And this number is how we write a long count. Um, and that is a count of days from that date, August 13, 31, 14 BC. Although there's a little bit of debate between scholars about whether it was August 11th, whether it was August 13th, or whether it was August 14th. But putting that aside for now, this says it's nine periods of 400 tunes or 400 periods of 360 days, basically 400 years times nine t since 3114 BC. And this says in, in the ninth Baktun, it's the 11th Katun. So it's 11 periods of 
20 years or 20 periods of 360 days. And so prior to this particular date, this king, Kakuti Witzkawil, the 12th ruler of Kopan, was erecting a number of stele, not necessarily just inside the city of Kopan proper, but around the, the valley, actually, around the, the mountains, quite far away from, from the actual site itself. And what's also really interesting is that these stele were covered with texts and didn't have images of the king that you see in many other Maya sites and even in earlier rulers in Copan, where they're kind of showing themselves as mythological beings. And so the texts are really, really interesting in this case, and we're going to look at some of them. This is one of the earlier monuments, which does show him, uh, Ruler 12, actually, Kakuti uh, Witzkawil, but, but the valley stele that we'll look at do not have his image. Okay, so he erected Stela 13, which has the date of 911000. Um, this is just uh, another way of talking about this particular date in two other calendar systems. This is the 260-day calendar where you have a number 1 through 13 and a day name uh, out of 20 different days, and that's a pan-Mesoamerican tradition to have the 260-day cycle. And often in many cultures in Mesoamerica, you have people named after the day that they're born on, or you know it, it tells you about their personality. Uh, but the cartoons will always be fall on the day Ahau because the zeroth day is the 20th day, which is always Ahau, which means Lord. And in this case, this day 12 Ahau fell in the 365 day calendar, so which corresponds to our, our tropical year, roughly, without the leap year, is in the month of Ke on the eighth day. And so in this case, there's actually 18 quote unquote months, which are really 20 day periods because the Maya counted in 20s rather than 10s because they counted on their fingers and toes. Um, and so I guess they wore sandals, right? So anyway, um, this is the eighth day of the, the period of Ke. And so 18 uh, of these periods times 20 days makes 360 days. And then there's a five day period at the end. So this day of this, this important day of the cartoon was on October 14th, in 652 AD. Okay, commemoration of the cartoon. And we see that date actually right on here. And here it is. This is actually the day 12, Ahau. And then here is the month of Ke, where you have the, the number eroded. But it's okay. We actually know that it has to be 8 Ke. We can see bar and one dot there. But we know it has to be 8 Ke because we can see the rest of the long count here. And this is an unambiguous date so that if we just have some portions of it, like just this number, we can tell that th this must also be true. So it's a really nice triangulation in case we have eroded glyphs, which we almost always have in what we call the Murphy's Law of Epigraphy. There's almost, al almost always something missing. But in dates like this, we can reconstruct it. Okay. So that map that we looked at of the city of Copan is just right there. So the city of Copan is in the Valley of Copan here. It's a beautiful location right along the Copan River, which allowed farmers here for many thousands of years to actually grow uh, milpas, corn, beans, squash, and so on. And so this became a city in the, in the pre-classic, actually, before the classic period began, which is right around, you know, 300 AD or so, although we are pushing that date back and we can see that there was a lot more city building even in earlier times in what we call the pre-classic, going way back, you know, to a thousand BC or so. And I think that the inhabitation of this, this site actually goes back that far. So the stele that this ruler erected were far from the actual city itself, all the way out here. The one we just looked at is Stela 13, which has that date. 911000 on it. But what I'll be talking about today are this Stila Stila 12 and this Stila Stila 10. And they actually form a line which goes right through the southern part of the city, like this. <clears throat> and it's called the Copan Baseline because it was uh, it was known about for quite some time. And, and these Stila are up on hills. This one's on a very high hill. And you can see, especially if you light a fire, you can see one of the stele from the other. And astronomers and you know uh, Europeans, explorers who were looking at this site 
were fascinated by this and said, aha, this must be some kind of a sundial because when you stand at the position of Stila 12 and look toward the west on April 10th, you will see the, uh, the sun actually set right behind this Stila. But at that time, back in the early 1900s, um, nobody knew how to read the glyphs and we didn't know how to correlate the Maya calendar with the Western European calendar. But one of the hypotheses was is that the dates, we could read the dates on these two stela and they are different from one another. But one of the hypotheses was that these dates would correspond to that date, April 10th. And I think the other corresponding date actually was in the fall um, in September. But uh, anyway, hold that thought and we'll talk about what happened when we actually now can correlate the calendars together. When we figured out what the calendar correlation was back in the 1930s uh, with what's called the Goodman, Martinez, and Thompson, three different people who are working on this, they figured out what the calendar correlation with the, with the Gregorian and Julian calendars are. Now, when we figured that out, the dates on these two stela did not correspond anywhere near to the dates when you would see the sun behind stela 10. So that's where I come in and, and what I've been doing with this site. This was published way back in, I believe the 1920s, 1926. And this shows that hypothesis of, you know, standing by Stila 12, which was knocked over actually um, some time, a long time ago, but uh, it's since been glued back together and placed upright. But standing here at Stila 12 and looking towards Stila, Stila 10, seeing the sun behind that point around April 10th, I believe. Okay, so it was, thought that this must be some type of a, a sundial or a count, something that was able to allow them to keep track of the calendar. And here again is another schematic uh, here showing standing from Stila 12, looking towards Stila 10 on April 10th. And once again, it's all over the place. In this case, it says April 12th. Um, and it was somewhere, in, I think, on in April 10th, April 12th, I think I actually went down, when I went down there and recalculated this, um, I think I found it to be April 10th, but nevertheless, this is actually a photograph of what it would actually look like when you're standing there. Um, in this case, this is not looking at Stila, Stila 10 from Stila 12. This is looking behind Stila 12, actually towards the sunrise, which is interesting because uh, that was what I found to be more compelling. And this is Stila 12 now, glued back together and standing upright and looking towards Stila 10. Okay, so Stila 10, which is the one on the west that is higher up on the hill, has a date, which is 9, 10, 19, 13, 0, 3, Ahau, 8, Yashkin, which corresponds to July 6th, 652, not anywhere near April. Well, that's interesting. Stila 12, the eastern marker on, uh, well, it says the west side, but it's actually the east side, sorry. The, it's the west side of this particular hill. Um, anyway, this date is 9, 10, 15, 0, 0, 6, Ahau, 13, Mach. The date is November 10th, 647. Also not near that April 10th date. So what's going on here? I asked and many others asked before me. But when I went to look at the rest of the text on Stila 12, I found something very, very interesting. And that's what I'll talk about here. In this case, um, it has the date of when Ruler 12 became king with that 6, uh, six Chikchan 18 Kayab date here on February 8th, 6, 8, 628. And then it counts forward and it says he witnessed the Tun completion or the completion of 9-11-0-0-0, that famous cartoon that he was preparing for on October 14, 652. And it says it was completed the 11th cartoon. And that's what that says here. Sutzach. And then 11 cartoons. Actually, this says more than 11. It's actually a bit of a, a mis, misdrawing in this case. Okay. And the, the statement it then says in the way that Maya texts work is they will talk about the dates and then they talk about what happened on those dates um, and with the verb first. So, and because they are uh, actually placed the verb first in their sentences, unlike we do, we place the subject first. But it says, was witnessed the first earthly edge of the sky 
the first three central hearth tone place. So you see that glyph down there that says Yash, and this is three hearthstones or the three stones that are placed in the center still today of traditional Maya households where they will place these three stones with a fire in the center in order to place a flat griddle on top or a komal. Um, and that is, the, that is basically the hearth or the cooking fire for the house. But this is a cosmic cooking fire. And so this is corresponding to a known constellation that we know about from the Kiche Maya who still see it today. And I'll talk about that. And this whole statement here um, of witnessing something is very interesting because it puts in the present that he is witnessing on this date, this historical cartoon date, he's witnessing this mythological astronomical position, which we see in the creation story texts, which are always written as the edge of the sky, the first three hearthstone place. So one of the other stele in uh, Ruler 12's uh, building uh, monuments that he set up for this particular date is unfortunately now destroyed. And so this was destroyed earlier in the 20th century. It was completely, this is Stila 23, it was completely uh, chopped up and used as fill in a cement wall. And unfortunately, this is what can happen to to ar the archaeological record, it gets recycled and used and destroyed. But luckily, actually, we have um, a drawing from Morley, who was in the early part of the 20th century, uh, one of the most renowned Maya archaeologists working for the Carnegie Foundation. But it had a completely missing segment here, which had the long count date on it. But luckily, it has the other components of the date, the calendar round. And then it counts forward to uh, to a position which reaches the accession date of Ruler 12 again. But what's significant about this is it's the first monument to ever mention this particular date here. This is for Ahau 8 Komku, and that is the creation date. The actual date here that of the long count we've been able to reconstruct as, ju as June 30th in the year 651. And that's this component here. But then it counts forward to 9-11-0-0-0, which is that same date of the accession. And it wraps over from the front to the side here. Um, it's the date of the accession of ruler. I'm sorry, the date, not the accession, but the date of the commemoration of the cartoon, the 11th cartoon. And then we have this count backwards in time all the way to 4 ahau 8 kumku right here. For how it come to, and then the usual uh, statement on many other monuments that we see elsewhere, especially in Palenque, but throughout the Maya area in the classic period, is on this date, this so called creation date, it has this verb was completed or were completed 13 baktuns, and that portion is mostly eroded. But we know that it says that because it then has this other component, which is what is that there? You got it, the three hearthstone place once again. And then it says three hearthstones were renewed up here. And so that is that interesting statement that usually together with the completion of a previous cycle of 13 baktuns that ended on this date for how eight kumku, it says that the three hearthstones were renewed. And we know a lot more about that, that particular statement, having studied it in Palenque and elsewhere. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But what's significant about that stila, and, and you know, it doesn't exist anymore, but luckily we're able to see that drawing from Morley. Uh, it is the first time that any classic Maya or any Maya um, inscription contains that, uh, on the monument contains that date for how eight Kumku, the beginning of the current long count. We do have an undated jade mask. This is a really spectacular small masquette, really, that was not used for a human mask, but probably hung from a belt. And it's an image of a deity that we call G1 or God One from the Palenque Triad. Um, and they were given names G1, G2, and G3 by Heinrich Berlin, who was studying the inscriptions in Palenque. Um, this is not from Palenque, it's probably from a site called Rio Azul, because it looks a lot like another uh, image that we see from Rio Azul, but we don't know where this came from, because it was looted and then shows up, uh, and I, I don't believe, I don't know where it is at the moment, I think it's in a museum, 
I hope. Um, but it has that date for how. It doesn't have the eight kumku, but if you look and see, you can see how it's quite small. You can see that statement, actually, the edge of the sky, the first three hearthstone place. And here it is again. On for how eight kumku, we have an interesting verb here. And it's actually the image of the weenik, which means person surrounded by smoke or flames. I believe it's a verb that means self-immolation. And I'll explain that in a bit or to burn oneself. And it says at the edge of the sky, the first three hearthstone place. And then it has the subject of the sentence because the subject comes at the end of the Maya sentence. And it's this deity three uh, G1 who is on the front of the, uh, who is the mask itself. Okay. so. If on this date, for how it kumku, he burned himself at the edge of the sky in the first three hearthstone place, in that first fire, the fire of the cosmic hearth. And here is G1. So let's learn a little bit more about this. Here in the Palenque Temple of the Cross, this is far to the west from where Copan is. This is in the state of now Chiapas in Mexico. We have the same statement, for how it kumku, that, that, Creation date August 13th, 3114 BC. We're completed Tsutsi in this case, and then 13 Baktuns. And then we have a distance number uh, counting from another date, actually. Uh, but setting that aside, it says it was they were renewed, right? The image at the edge of the sky, the first three hearthstone place. So we see that repeated all over the place. This is an actual uh, monument, Stila Sea, from a, another site called Quirigua to just to the north, uh, northwest of Copan in Guatemala. Copan itself is in the northern part of Honduras, just across the border from Guatemala. It's the southernmost Maya city, actually. But in this case, in Quirigua, we have a a monument which actually is telling us a long count date. This is the initial series introductory glyph, or ISIG, we call it in epigraphy. And it says 13 baktuns, zero katuns, zero tuns, zero winals, zero kins. Kins is a day. A winal is that 20 year period or 20 day period. Tuns is a 360 day period. Katuns, a 20 times 360 day period. Baktuns is that, that 400 uh 400 times the the 360 day period so it's saying that a period of 13 baktuns or 5200 tunes or 5200 years give or take had come to an end on the day for how it come a previous cycle of creation had ended on the day for how it come and then it says helach kob they were renewed the hearthstones or the images and here's what the actual monument looks like. And then it goes on to talk about the three hearthstone place once again. So, and then it happened at the edge of the sky, the first three hearthstone place, and they were completed, the 13 Bach tunes. So this is a statement we see all over the place, but we see it for the first time showing up in Copan on Stila 23 commemorated for the 9-11-0-0-0 cartoon. Obviously, the long count had been in use for centuries. It goes all the way back to the first centuries BC, outside the Maya area. But we don't see any other earlier statement other than on that mask, which is undated. But we don't see any other monumental statement about this creation date before uh, Ruler 12 from Copan erects that Stila 23. This is a mask, actually, another jade mask at showing that same same deity who is G1, the god one from the Palenque triad. And in this case, you can see he always has those kind of swirly, crazy looking uh, god eyes, we call them. And he always has a big shark tooth. And, in, and he sometimes, you know, he's shown with catfish barbels and he has little spots on his cheek. On his head, he wears the offering bowl with the image of the sun on it. And this is what Merle Green Robertson called the quadripartite badge. And it's a burning bowl or brazier in which we find three elements. We find a stingray spine, which is used for perforation. And the kings used to perforate their genitals in order to bleed on pieces of paper and burn those pieces of paper as an auto sacrifice. And I believe that's actually in imitation of what this bowl actually represents, which is the, the bowl of, in which the sun itself is burned. 
So it's the solar offering bowl. There's also a conch shell, which is thought to represent um, female genitalia. So the stingray spine, male genitalia. And then there's a third element actually, which is a little bit more of a mystery. But you see these two spots on his cheek. These are actually reminiscent of the spots on the cheek of one of the hero twins from the Popo Vu, whose name is Hun Ahau. And the little spot usually represents the number one or Hun. Hun Ahau is one of the days in the 260 day calendar that, that, and it means one or first Lord. He's got catfish barbels because one thing that happens to those twins is when they're in the underworld of Shibalba, if you ever read the Popo Vu, which I highly recommend, um, when they're in the underworld of Shibalba, the Hunahau and his brother Yashbalam willingly jump into a fire to burn themselves up. And actually they do this um, in order to defeat the Lords of Death. The Lords of Death think, think, think that they're killing the, the twins. In fact, they say, hey, why don't we go have this drinking game to celebrate all of the victories that you guys are always having over us playing a ball game. And the twins know exactly that if they're burned alive, and if their bones are ground up like flour, like maize flour on a matate and then poured into the river in Shibalba, they knew that if that would happen to them, that they would be reborn. And in the Popovu, they're reborn as catfish. And I think that's exactly why we're seeing the catfish barbels here. And, and this story is actually a sim symbolic story that we see in different versions around Mesoamerica where we see this solar deity who jumps into a fire and in among the Aztec or the Mexica in central Mexico, the deity's name was Nanahuatzin. And in that story, all the gods gather together at Teotihuacan, which was an ancient city at the time of the Aztecs, um, where the, the Aztecs named it Teotihuacan, which means the place where men became gods. And so um, in that story on the top of the temple of the sun, the gods all got together at the end of the pre one of the previous cycles of creation and decided that one needed to jump into the fire in order to burn himself to become the son of this world and give out his light and his life so that all things can live. And it's a beautiful story, actually. Um, and in the Aztec version, this one deity who's named Tecusis Tecat, who was rich and covered with shells, his name means something like the Lord of Shells. He's covered with jade and shells, and he has a beautiful jade skirt, and he has the best incense, and he says, I'll do it. And he runs up to the edge of the fire, and, and he's too chicken. He doesn't jump in. And the gods say, oh, come on, just come on, do it. You can do it. So he goes a second time, and a second time he's too afraid to burn himself, and he chickens out. And the gods get more and more frustrated. He does it a third time and a fourth time. And by that time, the gods are totally frustrated and say, come on, get on with it. Just do it. You said you want to be the sun, then just be the sun. But of course, he was not humble enough. And he just was concerned about burning himself up and burning his nice fine jewels. And, you know, if he burns himself, then he's not going to possess anything anymore. It's kind of that, that King Midas lesson. And one of the other gods who was just the humble Nanawatsin, which means the the purulent one or the one who's covered with rotten sores. Um, he just used the scabs on his sores as incense and he just had a simple grass skirt and he said, I'll do it. And he, without thinking, he jumps right into the fire and he becomes the son of Tonatiu of the, at least the current cycle of creation at the time the Aztecs told the story. So the Maya version of the story, which is, goes back oh, even many hundreds of years before the Aztec version, is is a similar version and so in this case hunapu and his brother jump into the fire there are other versions uh, of this and actually in the aztec version tecusistikatl after nana watson jumps into the fire tecusistikatl is jealous so he jumps in after him and then there are two sons and the gods say well this is too much it's going to burn up the world and so they take a rabbit and throw it into the face of a tecusistikatl who becomes the moon and we still see the rabbit shape of the rabbit of the Easter bunny on the moon as it rises in the east uh, to this day. And actually cultures all over the world talk about the rabbit and the moon from China all the way through the Americas right? and even into Europe with Easter and Easter eggs and Easter bunnies. So the, the egg of the moon hatches the Easter bunny. But the, the Maya version, uh, it was two brothers, right? Hunahau and Yashbalam, and they jumped in together. And that may be a precursor to this story of these two deities. One becomes the sun and one becomes the moon. In fact, it says that 
in the Popol Vuh, that Hunahau becomes the sun and Yashbalam becomes the moon. Well, way back, and that's a Kiche version of the story written down about the 1500s, the oldest written story in the Americas. But in the classic period, the Maya story actually uh, is much earlier, and but the classic Maya story. And it looks like this deity G1 is that being who jumps into that fire. And that's exactly that story that we saw back here, where on this creation date, here he is, G1 with the spot on his cheek, which is that early version of Hunapu. He burns himself at the edge of the fire in the or the edge of the sky, the first three hearthstone place. Okay. This is actually the text on the back of that masquette, um, which has again another image of G1. And it has that quadripartite badge right here. Um, this is the quadripartite badge. Once again, it's the image of the sun or keen on an offering uh, bur burning brazier bowl with the stingray spine, the shell, and this cross bands element. This is another image of that burning brazier by itself, which is symbolic or, or represents the verb to burn. And that you can see fire smoke coming out of the bowl. And here it is again in the word for east. Uh, this word is el, to burn, and this, this is el kin, which means the east, or the place where the sun emerges as burning from the underworld. And one of the reasons we think that G1 here has this giant shark tooth is that it's like an egg tooth for uh, a bird or a reptile coming out of an egg. And so he cuts a hole in the earth, in the underworld, and allows the sun to emerge from the underworld and rise in the east. This image of this deity actually goes way back in time to this, uh, this mural from San Bartolo, which was only discovered in uh, the early 2000s. And uh, William Saturno and a number of his, well, his guides actually, his Maya guides, who some of whom were looters pre previously, had found this site, um, and it is of such significance. It's one of the only color murals surviving other than the Bonampak murals. But the Bonampak murals were actually uh, much later in the classic period, the late classic period. And, and this goes way back to the pre-classic. So before the Maya classic period, and the dates of these murals are actually um, in, the, I believe, the first, second century BC. They're quite old. And in this image, you see, it's not a very good photo in my slides here, but you see an image of a deity with the uh, dot on his cheek, that same type of Hunapu deity. And he is perforating his penis here. It's bleeding. This is that symbolism of auto-sacrifice. So the kings would have to imitate you know, the self-sacrifice of the gods. Hard to be the king. Um, anyway, so here's an image of, of that deity. And he's actually got a series of glyphs above him. And so what's extraordinary about this site is that we not only see some really early Maya artwork, we see some really early Maya writing. And early Maya writing is actually usually in single columns rather than the double columns that we see later on. But just a few of these glyphs can be translated. But this one right here, if you can see it, whoops, is the glyph for Venus or star. And then beneath it actually is a glyph, the Winik glyph actually, which is uh, for a person, but it also seems to be shown inside of what my friend Barb McLeod actually has seen as a, as a burning brazier, an, an incense burner. Um, and in this case, it looks like it says Venus person. So he is the Venus person. And that's very interesting because G1, uh, that first deity in the Palenque triad seems to carry the solar offering bowl on his head, but he also seems to represent the deity uh, of the planet Venus. And how that works is rather interesting. Um, in the Maya Dresden Codex, which is a, one of the four surviving books, all of the other hundreds or thousands of books were burned uh, when the Spanish came over during the time of the Inquisition, unfortunately. But the Dresden Codex survived, and in the Dresden Codex we have an amazing record of a Venus table, which actually is also found in similar form in central Mexican codices, of which there are many more than four. And the Mesoamerican Venus tables actually are always in five parts. So the cycle of Venus actually um, 
goes through five complete cycles of where Venus rises as morning star, which is the most significant position. It, it announces the, the sunrise actually in the east. So Venus actually in astronomical terms is going faster than the earth and, and it's passing the earth in its orbit, kind of like on a racetrack, on an inside racetrack. And it disappears for about eight days when it's in front of the sun. And for Mesoamericans, that represented the Venus deity jumping into the fire of the sun and then resurrecting and being reborn as morning star. And so it is that same symbolism, I believe, of the solar self-sacrifice of G1. So G1 is both the sun and Venus at the same time. You can see it that way. And in fact, when they depict the face of the sun, he usually always has the same face as the, the face of Venus, the Venus deity. And so this Venus dives into in front of the sun at its most brilliant as evening star in the West, disappears, and then is resurrected a few days later, eight days later. And in the Popol Vuh, it says the, the twins disappeared um, after they jump into the fire, their bones are, are ground up into powder and then the powder is poured or the paste powder is poured into a river and then they are resurrected a few days later as catfish and then they sprout arms and legs and then they actually turn into people again uh, it's quite an amazing story so the interesting part of this for me also is in studying archaeoastronomy is that uh, these cycles of venus are always in five parts because in five cycles of the cycle of venus where venus reappears as morning star on the fifth cycle, it returns to eight, exactly eight Earth years. So 365 times eight is equivalent to the cycle of Venus, which is 584 days times five. So these fi cycles of five are very interesting. And in this image in San Bartolo, this is one of five Venus deities that's perforating himself. And he's named here as a Venus deity. So... I think this also goes together with five cycles of creation. It goes together with the five times it took in central Mexico for, you know, Nana Watson goes up to the edge of the sun, the, the temple of, uh, of the sun, the fire that was burning on the top. He does it four times and is unsuccessful. And then on the fifth time, it was Nana Watson who finally does the deed. So you have all of the symbolism of Venus and the sun and creations as being uh, having five different parts. Okay, so on to the, the actual three hearthstones. If you look at the constellation of Orion, what we call Orion, the Maya, back a long time ago, we think, but also the Kiche Maya today called three, these three stars, which are Alnitak, Saif, and Rigel, two of Orion's knees and one of the three belt stars. They call those the triangular three hearthstones. And that was something that came to the attention of Barbara Tedlock um, in her field work, working among the Kiche. And it was actually um, Kiche, uh, uh, it was actually elder women, an elder woman specifically, who was a day keeper, but also a, what they call a midwife, uh, who told her this. And they, midwives are not just for, you know, birthing and, and helping to give birth, but also they retain calendrical and astronomical information, all kinds of things like that. For the Aztec, this, these three stars are called the, the actual fire starter, the fire stick, the fire drill. So the stick that's used to start the fire. The Kiche call it the, the tale of the three fire lords. But one of those stars is one of the three stones. In the center, you have the Orion Nebula, or what's often called the sword or the sheath of the sword of Orion. It's another three star asterism. But in the central star, actually, and between the central and the bottom star, there is the Orion Nebula. And the whole thing together looks like smoke. And so for the Kiche today, they call it the smoke from the hearth fire that's in the center of the three stones, which is exactly how the Kiche actually have the stones and how modern Maya people put the three giant stones in the hearth fire with the fire in the center. And here's a nice comal with some cacao beans on top being roasted. Here you can see this uh, image from the Madrid Codex showing a turtle because the whole Orion constellation is often considered a turtle for the Maya. 
And on his back, he has the three hearthstones. And then here you see symbols for the sun. And that is actually called a sky band, which is this green line of the ecliptic that is the path of the sun. So interestingly, the sun never actually crosses in front of Orion. It goes nearby uh, by the Pleiades and so on. But nevertheless, this is the asterism called the three hearthstones. And in the center is the Orion Nebula, actually, which is that smoke from the first hearth fire. And this is a Hubble image, uh, Hubble's telescope image of the beautiful Orion Nebula, which is about 1300 light years away. So the light that you're seeing and the 700 some stars that are being formed inside this nebula right now, they uh, were actually seeing it back in time 1300 years ago, which is interesting because that's right around the time that our friend uh, Ruler 12 in Copan erected these monuments. So I think it's a really fascinating connection that we have at this very moment. Coincidentally, when we look at the Orion Nebula, we are looking back in time 1300 years to that time when, uh, when Ruler 12 was erecting these monuments about this very asterism. And what we know of the Orion Nebula is actually it's a place where a previous star went supernova, right? It's a place where you have the gas and dust collapsing into, uh, well, gas and dust that came from supernovas, so stardust from a star that, that gave its life and exploded. And it's collecting back into stars and forming baby stars. So new suns are being born in this place, some of which, the largest of which, will eventually go supernova again. So in, in what we know from astronomical science now is that what's fascinating, I think, is that this is a place where suns are born. And the story of the three hearthstones is about the birth of the sun. It's the place where, where the Maya say our current sun was born by self-sacrificing, by giving as, of its life. And they see the sun as an ancestor of all beings. So the sun gave of itself and constantly burns itself to this day in order to give out its energy and life in a generous way. And that's what the kings and queens on earth were supposed to do also and why they would perforate themselves and burn their these pieces of paper with the blood that they had, you know, from their bodies and uh, in imitation, I think, of this self-sacrifice of the sun. Some beautiful images of, of the Orion Nebula. Okay, so I'm going to skip a little bit over this here, but uh, in this case, this is just talking about how the Copan is just on a line uh, latitude 14.8 degrees north, where you have what's called the solar zenith passage happening, which is something that happens only in the tropics, where at the moment of noon, the sun actually is exactly in the center of the sky, perpendicular to the earth, and it can light up what's called a zenith tube. And we see several of these, these throughout Mesoamerica, not so many in the Maya area. But uh, this is one way to actually really accurately measure the length of the year. And this is something I, I've been working on in a recent paper. Um, and so uh, that is interesting because that date that that happens is on August 13th in Copan. Actually, it's on April 30th and then August 13th. It always happens twice as the sun moves north and it moves south. And Copan is in, situated just on this line where it happens on those two dates. And August 13th, of course, being that date of creation 3,000 or 5,000 some years ago on the date, uh, August 13th, 3114 BC. And that gives us an indication that the Maya knew how to calculate the year and their predecessors, whoever invented the long count, they must have known how to calculate the, the tropical year with such accuracy that they could back calculate to thousands of years before they were around to this date, August 13th. Um, and so it's really interesting, actually, because the two dates, August 13th and May, or April 30th, May 1st, are exactly 260 days apart, uh, which is that sacred cycle that we see throughout Mesoamerica. So it may be that Copan was placed at this latitude because most of the other Maya cities are up here. Copan is far to the south, and it may be because it's at this very special latitude where that happens on August 13th. And some of the early, early pre-classic sites also are found at this site, like Isapa and Takalik Abah and Kamenau Huyu. 
some more special effects here just to show you again. It's very Indiana Jones, right? The, the map room where the sun comes in, you know, it lights not from the side, but exactly from above. Okay. And here is an actual image of that happening at the moment of noon um, in a place called Xochicalco in central Mexico, where it's you still can see this to this day. And there is the oculus through which or the zenith portal. And these are kind of like chimneys, but they're not used for fire. They're used for tracking the position of the sun on the zenith passage. All right, so back to Stila 10 and Stila 12. Remember, if you will, that on Stila 12, it mentions that three hearthstone place, that Orion constellation, but it mentions it actually in the context of the king having seen it at the edge of the sky on 9-11-0-0-0. So while most people were thinking that, that you have to stand at Stila 12 and look towards Stila 10 at sunset on April 10th, for example, April 12th, I decided that maybe it's actually not looking in that direction, but if you stand at the high point of Stila 10 and look towards Stila 12 at sunrise, that I think very symbolic point of when the sun is coming out, uh, looking like it's coming out of the ground. If you instead look in that direction, what I found is something pretty interesting. Okay, here's a re reminder, right? Here's what it says on Stila 12. So we're looking at the Eastern marker here, Stila 12. It says, he witnesses the tune completion on 9-11-0-0-0. This is ruler 12. And then it says, he witnessed the first earthly edge of the sky. So what does that mean? In fact, we always see it later on when talking about the creation story, um, the edge of the sky, the first three hearthstone place, but it's not on the day of creation. It's a historical witnessing when ruler 12 is saying he saw the, the three hearthstones at the edge of the sky. And I wondered, is that actually talking about standing here on Stila 10 and looking at towards Stila 12 and then seeing something? Is it going to be the case that back at this time that the Orion constellation would have been rising at that point? And it turns out that's exactly what you can see. So here is the Stila 10 standing up at Stila 10 looking towards, and of course it can be very foggy and smoky um, in this valley, especially uh, when they're burning the milpas. But that is the hill at behind which actually, well, behind Stila 12. So Stila 12 is about here, and then there is a bit of a hill. And I think that's part of the reason why nobody thought to look in this direction because the, whereas Stila 10 is at the top of a hill and you can see the sun setting behind it. In this case, Stila 12 is not at the top of the hill, but there is actually a hill right behind it, behind which you would see the sunrise. And here's that hill. And there is about where Stila 12 is. See, it's a little farther down from the, the top of the hill. But when looking exactly at that azimuth at this point, I was able to reconstruct that right at that point, right here, you have this happen. So looking back and adjusting for where the stars were at the time, you see here the Orion's belt. Exactly at that azimuth, you see the Orion Nebula rising. And that was pretty interesting to me because that's exactly what it says on that monument. If we take the text for what it says, it says the king witnessed on 9-11-0-0-0 the, the Orion Nebula, so the, or the Orion Hearthstones, right? So the three Hearthstones are here, and then the smoke from the first hearth, hearth fire is right there. But why on that date? So this happens every, every day, basically, or every night, you can see the Orion constellation rising at different times, exactly at that point, uh, 1300 years ago. But why on 9-11-0-0-0? Well, <clears throat> when I actually adjusted, <clears throat> excuse me, for the actual date, 9-11-0-0-0, um, which was on October 12th, then on that date, in fact, you see, I think the monument here, do I have it here? Here it is. Check out what happens. So this is a, using Starry Night astronomy software, but when I was able to do this exactly at the azimuth, <clears throat> which, is, which is laid out by the line between Stila 10 looking towards Stila 12, that's the exact point of the sunrise on that cartoon date of 9 11 
which then finally made sense of why he's talking about this. So not only is it the rising point of the sunrise on that day, <clears throat> it's exactly the rising point of where the Orion Nebula rose in the Orion uh, Hearthstone constellation. But as I said, the sun is never exactly in front of that Orion constellation. But why I think that, you know, they're making this association back then is that it is the, sh it's the same point on the horizon where the Orion constellation, the Orion Nebula, or the birth of the sun was on the moment of creation, or that last cycle of creation, August 13, 31, 14 BC. So it symbolically ties that 9-11-000 cartoon to that date of creation. And thereafter, that, that uh, three hearthstone place becomes associated with this time of creation. Well, some other really interesting research that's happening, <clears throat> actually, well, let me talk about this too. The, that stela that was destroyed, stela 23, which it dates to June 30th, July 1st, 653, um, on that date, actually, what's interesting here is that you actually would see the very first appearance of the Orion Nebula just before the sunrise. And so it was just visible just before the sunrise, which is why I think they were mentioning that particular date as well. And here again. And then on Stela 10, the point at which I think they were observing all of this which is dated to July 6th. On that date, the hearth fire was first visible rising at sunrise as well. So the nodes at that case, that which were about eclipses, were at the solstices, and it was just before, four days before, or four days after a lunar eclipse. Okay. So what I wanted to mention actually is uh, one of my friends, Hutch Kinsman, has been looking into whether the Maya were tracking meteor showers. And what I think is really interesting is that one of the reasons they chose the 3114 BC date um, is that the actual date at that time was the date of the Orionid meteor shower. So if they knew about this, which I think that there's every indication that they did, <clears throat> that the creators of the long count back calculated to the time when the August 13th zenith passage of the sun corresponded to the date of the Orionid meteor shower. So not only would you see the this, uh, well, and this is something that they never would have witnessed themselves, but that they knew must have happened at that date, thousands of years before they were around, that the Orion constellation here, the three hearthstones, um, is symbolic in that in that case because there would have been uh, the radiant of this particular meteor shower there would be sparks flying out of you know, symbolically these meteors or meteorites coming from looking like they're coming from the orion constellation itself and that i think is a really spectacular story um, so that concludes my presentation for today um, and so it just goes to show, I think, that, you know, the sophistication of the astronomical knowledge that the classic Maya had and their predecessors and their descendants still have today in many cases. Um, it's, it's often quite surprising to people to realize how much they were able to know and how much they, they were actually using their knowledge of the sky. But they were also weaving it together with their mythology and with their symbolic stories of the, where the sun comes from and the meaningfulness of what the sun is as a being that is burning itself in a very generous way in order to uh, allow everything to come to life and to grow maize which grows people um, and so it's seen as an ancestor and and as a model for humanity of self-sacrifice and generosity so thank you very much it's been a great pleasure to, to talk to you today. I hope you got something out of this presentation and, uh, and hopefully we'll do it again sometime. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Um, uh, if there's any questions from Joe that might help you. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't seem we have any questions. Um, I do have a, one quick question for you, Michael, sure. and it might be just a seriously novice. Oh. Novice question. Um, that 
through the pre-classic and the classic and the post-classic periods were, um, did the creation stories evolve or change at all so that oh, the current yeah. Maya? Without a doubt. So yeah. I think we can also see, you know, that not only the Kiche who recorded this in the Popo Vu have their own version uh -huh. that other Maya groups, and there's about 29 different languages still spoken. It's not just one monolithic culture that they all had different versions of these stories. Um, and in, in some cases they had overlapping versions, even in the same story. So the Popo Vu tells multiple different versions of what happened at the end of the last creation. In one example, it's the hero twins, you know, self-sacrificing and, and playing ball against the Lords of Death. In another mm -hmm. version, it's this, uh, the ruler Seven Macaw, who's sitting here on my shoulder, um, mm -hmm. who was the greedy ruler of the last world and, you know, the monkey people who were, you know, worshiping him as a false god. Uh, that's a, a parallel and different version. But we can see that, that all these different versions in some form trace all the way back to the earliest examples that we have in Isapa from about 600 BC. Uh, those are the first examples. And, and there's some earlier examples even in Kaminal Kuyu, which show this, uh, you know, this, this macaw or bird deity human and, uh, and the importance of that imagery for kingship. But yes, there's lots of versions. And I think that some of those versions even changed after the collapse of the classic period. So the version in the Popol Vu talks about um, how the people of the previous world, the wooden people abused their animals and they abused their material things and just threw out their pots and pans and their plates after just one usage, sounding familiar. And uh, yeah. anyway, and they chopped all their trees down, right? They're basically destroying their world and they're forgetting their connection to nature, to the creators. Uh, so it, and for that reason, the creators decide to flood the world and, and purify it and destroy them. And I think that some of the those stories are are having lived through the experience of seeing what happens when you build too many cities and you know you chop down too much forest, and we know that probably contributed to the classic period collapse in about mm -hmm. eight nine hundred A.D. Um, and I think those stories about the wooden people and you know and what happened to them are, are is at least shaped in part by that more recent event even though those stories go back way before uh, they weren't we don't have any version of that story that goes back before that time like in in the hieroglyphs i think that version really especially became important after the collapse so yes there's there's always multiple versions um and i think in western tradition we are threatened by the idea that there's more than one creation story we like to just have it be one true story that's literal but right. if you look at a lot of other traditions, uh, Native American traditions and traditions from around the world, that there's multiple versions of symbolic stories that you know, have deep, profound meaning, but not necessarily made to be taken literally. And, and do you think that the story about Nanawetsin is, um, was brought to Teotihuacan from, because my understanding was that it was a big center for trade and there were different communities and different peoples that would yeah, go through. The story of Nani Watsin is a Aztec or Mexica story, right? Um, which goes back probably to Toltec times also before them. So oh. those were, you know, people, you know, since about a thousand AD, but the Aztecs were, were you know, 13, 1400s, 1500s AD, right. much later. But the Aztecs talked about Teotihuacan, they named it Teotihuacan. We don't know the original name of that city, although some have suggested it is the mythical Tolan, the place of reeds. And the Maya refer to Teotihuacan as that, um, or Puj, which is the place of reeds. And, and Teotihuacan certainly influenced the Maya way back when. And, uh, and we can see that in the early classic, the people from Teotihuacan came into and founded some of the dynasties uh, in Copan and, and, and elsewhere, and Tikal. But uh, as far as, you know, what the Teotihuacanos stories were telling, you know, we don't have very much record of that. Um, I think certainly there were similar versions of the story, but <clears throat> we don't even know what they called the Temple of the Sun, and it may not have actually even been the Temple of the Sun. That was what the Aztecs called it. 
So the Aztecs right. told stories about Teotihuacan as this place, you know, built by the gods or where right. men became gods, you know, where kings would go to, to, for their investiture. And, and I think that really there is some historical evidence for that because a lot of the Maya kings would say, well, you know, I went to Teotihuacan and you know, this kind of thing. And I have my authority because I'm from Teotihuacan, that, that type of thing. So, yeah, but as far as what the Teotihuacanos were saying and this, their stories, we don't know as much about their you know, stories about the sun and that kind of thing. But I do definitely think that the story of Nanahuatzin is, is a reflex or is a, it has a common ancestor with the Maya story that we were talking about in the Popo Vuh and, and then the earlier classic period story. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, if there are uh, no more questions, I guess we'll end the session and the series. Okay. And um, thank you so much, Michael, for You're being welcome. here. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. And, and uh, maybe and next time we'll have more people show up when, when they're not there. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? You know, like I said, everyone's so excited about being able to be outside and stuff. So. I know. Well, maybe next time I can come there in person. That would be really fun. Absolutely. That would be wonderful. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Sounds good, Chris. All, All right. right. Take, Take care. care. We'll see you All later, right. Michael. Thank you. Mm -hmm.